All right, yeah, exactly. I, I, uh, they scratched the title and then I had to tell them again. No, this is the title. Jacob has a horse, says Travis. A tale of truths in a microservice architecture. Um, yeah, it's a pretty strange statement and I'm trying to make a point in this presentation and I hope when we reach the end of this half hour that it's abundantly clear what we're saying here. Or what I'm saying at least. Um, who am I? My name's Jacob, I work at Curity. Uh, primarily, I work with these two standards, OAuth and OpenID. That's where we spend our days. We, uh, we implement an OAuth server and an OpenID Connect provider, and uh, we read a lot of the standards, think a lot of these problems, so, so we're kind of geeks in this area. Um, I could also present myself like this. Uh, I have a name, it's Jacob. I have an age, 38, if you wonder. I'm 177 centimeters tall. Um, I'm a father, I have a son. This picture was taken at some cafe. It was sunny, I think, um, outside at least. So when I go online and do stuff, similar attributes about me are useful. When I go to a clothing store um, and buy something, they might be interested in knowing my height, my shirt size, perhaps my age, things that could help them you know, make decisions on what, what I need. Right? So there are different ways of representing me. But I think, I think perhaps we're getting ahead of ourselves a bit. What we need to talk about today is how do we encapsulate these things in our APIs? and make it useful. And in order to understand that, um, Tina already mentioned that wouldn't it be great if your APIs could know who you are? And you all think, yeah, we know how to do that. It's OAuth. It is. But we aren't all there. So we defined something I call the API security maturity model. And I stole that idea from the REST maturity model and applied it to API security instead. So part one of my talk, I'll explain this model, and in part two, we'll see where we, what we can use it for. Level zero, API keys and basic authentication. This is where most people started a couple of years ago. Um, OAuth was still a bit of an unknown to a lot of people, so you bought a gateway, you used API keys, or you simply used basic auth because you know it. It's good, it works. So if we take this, this example of me buying stuff at a clothing store, and we make it as a bit more realistic, just a bit, <laughs> that there's probably some front-end web service, some app serving the, the store that I'm in, and there's probably a couple APIs there, an inventory and, a, and a, an API where I can purchase stuff that the clothing store will access. So I don't access those directly from the browser. So when those are communicated to by the front end. We send some authorization header with some basic auth. And if we need to send other information here, we need to pass that along. So the user information simply needs to go next to the authentication information. Perhaps in the body, perhaps in the URL, doesn't really matter. But the API definitely wants to know, OK, who is buying stuff? Because we need to ship it somewhere. You should all know this, but let's go through it anyway. What's the problem with API keys and basic auth? We're doing machine verification-ish. We're, we're doing service verification, server to service. They can talk. So we know service A can talk to service B. The user isn't bound to the requested resource. So we're, we did only verify that the service was there, not that the user. We sent that. We only did authentication. We only answered the question, who? Who is the service call is calling? We didn't really do any authorization. We didn't say, what can this service do? So the protocol, if you will, of basic auth, or API keys, if you, there is such a protocol, uh, doesn't provide anything around this. So that takes us to the next level of the maturity model. Token-based authentication. I'm going to illustrate this with another example. Um, think of a publisher. 
I think a publisher is a nice example because there are some, some aspects of this, of being a publisher, that, that actually are interesting. Like you're publishing a newspaper or, or something like that. Let's assume we have an organization where reporters eagerly write articles. Now we have a token-based authentication mechanism, so they log into their, their workstations, log into their app, and then they start publishing stuff. And we're passing tokens around. So when you logged in, you got an access token, you publish stuff to the content API, which is our main API for keeping stuff. And then on the other side, we, we have, once again, some sort of app, this, this web thing where people go and, and read the news. Right? This one also needs to talk to the same API. So it also needs an access token. However, in this case, it's an open website, so there's no user logged in, really. So it needs a machine uh, token to talk to the same API. So sometimes the token contains a system ID. Sometimes it contains a user ID. Um, So obviously, the, we have similar issues if, we're, if we move to a token-based architecture, but we only use it for authentication, because we want to share APIs. Sometimes we have privileged access, sometimes we don't. And if we only use the access token for authentication, we have to build all this logic. And that's, that's what people do. Um, we all build if statements all over the code, we look up extra stuff, we figure out, should we or should we not allow this operation to occur? Because there is no authorization performed by just using a username and a token. We just say yes or no. We don't answer, answer the question of what are you allowed to do. And in this case, we had machine access to the same API or service access. So we want to know if you, are, if you hack the web server, can you publish more content to the API? And why, why am I thinking that it's an interesting thing with a publisher? Well, actually, at least in Sweden, if you're a publisher and you're publishing news, someone's responsible. So if some news go out that are unfounded or slander or something like that, you can actually get sued, and the editor-in-chief could go to prison. So it's, it's a pretty severe thing that can happen on a pretty low risk or low value data, if you will. Um, but the consequences could be quite alarming. So I, I kind of think it's an interesting example. So they ha we have to build all these mechanisms into the API in order to solve this. We can't rely on the protocol if we do it like this. So as a result, anyone who obtains a token here can modify the content API. And since we have machine access, it's not very hard to obtain a token. You don't even need to use your own username if you can access that machine instead. So nobody's doing that, obviously, right? Um, so let's talk about the third level, token-based authorization. Authorization is answering the question, what are you allowed to do? So we can use OAuth and other protocols, but really OAuth, to do token-based authorization. When, what do most people do? Where, what's the state of, of the industry? Well, in order to understand that, we need to look at some concepts of OAuth first. We, there's a, a thing called scopes. Um, scopes are simply named permissions in a token, or at least that's how many people use them. They're strings. They do not contain any values, and the client requests them. And they are authorized by the OWASP server. So this means that when, when a web client, for instance, wants to call the content API, it says, hey, I need some scope to access this content API. The OWASP server says, sure, you get this. Sometimes a user is involved also approving this. That's what scopes are. They look like this. We have, we can make them up. That's the nice part about scopes. We can define our own. So we can say, yeah, we have this content API. Let's figure out a nice couple of scopes. Content read, content write. Perfect. Problem solved with the publisher. The web service can do content read. Everybody else can do content write. There is no way that you can obtain a token without a user logging in that could update the published uh, publish data. Super simple approach. 
effective approach in a lot of cases and a good base. There are standard scopes defined by OpenID like email and address, which if you can get those, you will most likely be able to obtain that type of information about a user. And you could you know, think of any type of scope, invoice list. Somebody could list the invoices or something. So scopes bring us sort of to the third level, token-based authorization. They can help us get there, at least. And if you compare that to building in everything into a big if statement in the API, now at least you can rely on what the token says when it comes in. So the protocol gives you more. So let's, let's talk about a, another example. Uh, in, in Sweden, we have this app called Swish. Um, we use it to transfer money. Uh, you can pay with it, and you can transfer money to other people. It's, it's got other apps in other countries, I know. But uh, essentially, you use the phone number of the other user, and you can say, hey, send, send 100 kroner to that person. Super simple and very convenient. So Swish is combined with another app called Bank ID. And Bank ID is, uh, is sort of a national EID in Sweden, provided by the bank. So I guess it's not a national EID, but it's the only one we got. So when you want to use the Swish app, it opens Bank ID first, communicates with the Bank ID server, you log in, and then it jumps back to the Swish app, and now you're pretty thoroughly authenticated. The Swish app has a pretty good idea of who you are. Um, Let's assume that Swish know what they're doing, so they probably do have a, a token-based authorization, like we talked about. But last year, I think it was, a clever programmer realized that if I decompile this app, I want to see the traffic that's going on. So I decompiled the app. And then figured out, OK, I need, I need to use this pinned certificate to communicate with the server, or to intercept the traffic and, and proxy it. And when he did that, he saw this. When, pin, when Swish wants to list all your history of the transactions you've done, they make this request. Authenticate it with bank ID, and you have a token, and everything explaining who you are and what you're allowed to do. And then they make this. Payment history slash phone number slash all. Anyone see an issue with that? Yeah. So if you put any other phone number in there, you get that person's payment history. Even though we built all this nice infrastructure, all these tokens going back and forth, PIN certificates, everything around it, and then we have this API call where we built identity directly into the API. OK. The world is pretty complex for us now. I mean, we've been doing Nordic APIs since 2013, and that's, that's kind of, APIs weren't brand new then. So things are happening, and our systems are getting more complex. I mean, the, ones, the examples I gave, they were naive. This is more what it looks like, and even worse, of course. We have apps calling proxies and services, calling APIs, calling other APIs, checking up data, doing things. It's a pretty nasty structure after a while. And then, all of a sudden, in the middle of this, one of the APIs decides, oh, in order to call the next API, I need to add the phone number, for instance, like we just saw with the Swish app, right? And then the next API sees this and it's like, oh, great, yeah, cool, but I'm, oh, yeah, I need to call another endpoint on the first API again. So I'm just forwarding stuff I know because I got it. So phone number, here you go. So what could possibly go wrong with this? What can happen when an API calls another API? Who trusts who is a better question to, to ask yourself. Where does information come from? Who can add it along the way? As you start looking at this, when you, when you have your API infrastructure in front of you, and seeing where does information get added, you kind of end up in something we call a spaghetti of trust. It's super hard to untangle. Every place where you start adding information, you add a new piece of spaghetti. And everybody has to rely on that information. That brings us to the last step of the API security maturity model. Centralized trust using claims. So, that was the intro. 
claims, the missing piece. Now that we know the problem, we can start diving into the solution. So we need to talk about trust. Who do we trust in our APIs? Do we trust the caller of the API? Do we trust the API gateway? Well, probably some, right? But the API gateway is on the, on the furthest edge of our network almost, so we should, we should trust it to some extent. Do we trust the issuer of tokens in our network? Who issues tokens? Do we create tokens here and there? Do we read up data and, and somehow package it and send it forward? Data that could be sensitive and could be tampered with or changed? Well, maybe we trust the issuer of tokens then. I guess that's a good answer, right? Do we trust the user database? Who can ask it? Like, how many systems can access it? Or other databases? So trust is a pretty, pretty strange thing when you read about it. This was the simplest explanation I found. Trust is a subjective assessment of another's influence in terms of the extent of one's perception about the quality and significance of another's impact over and one's outcome in a given situation, such that one's expectation of openness to and inclination towards such influence provides a sense of control over the potential outcomes of the situation. <laughs> That's a mouthful. Right? So in other words, I, we should think of it like this. Trust is subjective. We decide who to trust. Everybody doesn't trust the same thing. Your organization trusts something, another organization trusts something else. Trust does not guarantee absolute truth. Um, you define, sort of, how, how, come, how true do we think this is? Well, how well did you log in the user? Whoops. <laughs> Got a falling P. How well do you know the user? Well, just make an assessment. And then, if you, it's not absolute, but it's perhaps good enough. But what it does is, it helps us predict the correctness of a decision. If you can trust the data to be correct when it comes in, it's more likely that the, that the decision you take will be accurate and that you won't get sued way later. Sued, perhaps not always the problem, but you know, you get my point. So trust works like this. In a simple scenario, you, you define a common party. We call, it, we call it the issuer or the authority. And then you have a requesting party and a relying party. And essentially, the requesting party wants to do something at the relying party. So let's step back again. So here's me. Name, age, length. I'm a father, I have a son. It was sunny, it was at some cafe. If we break this down, we can see that some of these attributes we call context attributes. They tell us something about the situation when we snap this picture, when we figured out, who am I? It was sunny, we were at some cafe. The other attributes, they are what we call subject attributes. They tell us something about, who am I? They're tied to my persona, my digital identity. Who can assert this? Who can say that's true? Just because somebody took a picture of me doesn't mean they know, or if they show it to someone, you don't know it's me. So in Sweden, there are two parties who can assert this. The tax authority, Skatteverket, and the police. The police issues passports, and if I show you a passport, I can tell you I am 38 years old. And if I show you a document from the tax authority, I can show you, yes, this is my son. If you trust those two authorities, you will trust that information. Simple as that. We all do it. So that means we should trust claims. We don't trust attributes. An attribute is first name equals Jacob. That's an attribute. Age equals 38. Length, 177. Those are attributes. Claims, they have a different form. Skatteverket says, the first name of this person is Jacob. Jacob is 38, says the police. Jacob has a son, says Skatteverket. The anatomy of a claim is that we have a subject, we have an attribute, and we have an asserting party. 
Jacob is 177 centimeters tall, says the police. Somebody is asserting this attribute about this subject. So how can we trust data then that comes in? How can we know that it's claims? Well, we could always verify all incoming data against the original source and say, hey, do you claim this is true? That would be defeating the point of passing data around. So what we do is we trust a common party to provide this data for us so that we can verify it. So if I need to call a relying party, somebody, I first call the issuer and say, hey, can you issue some data about Jacob? And then they say, yeah, here's some data about Jacob. I send that on to the next party, and then they can check. Was this from you? Yeah, OK. Except we usually do like this. The issuer signs the data using a private key, and then the relying party can just verify that signature with the public key. That's how we do it most often. A lot of light bulbs go off now, right? You're like, I can use a jot. That's exactly what a jot is. It's a signed piece of data. And if you start looking at a jot, you can see there are claims in there. All of the attributes there, almost, are claims. There's a subject in there, sub. That's a subject. So everything in this token says something about Jane Doe at example.com. It says that the name is Jane Doe. It says that the subscriber ID is abc123. And it's issued by login.curity.io. So there's an authority. There's an issuer. So if you have the key from login.curity.io, you can verify that this came from them. And if you trust them, it's good to go. The data is here. So, let's lose. so instead of just sending any arbitrary signed document, you send a JOT. But a JOT is not a protocol. I don't know how many discussions I've had on this conference and others where you hear that, yeah, we, we went with the JOT. <laughs> it's a great solution. We're secure now. So I said, do you use OAuth? Do you use OpenID with the JOT? No, just a JOT. We make them. So think of it like this. A JOT is a car. You get in your car and you drive, and you feel safe. But the thing is, you're not safe because you're in a car. You're safe because there are traffic rules. You know that when you drive on the highway, nobody will drive in the opposite direction, hopefully. So a jot is like a car, and a protocol is like the traffic rules. So you need a protocol in order to use these things. If you don't use a protocol, you're inventing new traffic rules, and you're on your own and most likely you'll fail. It's pretty hard. Luckily, there are two very good standards. Who would have figured, right? OAuth and OpenID, they provide these rules that you need in order to sort of make sense of how to use these tokens, how to, how to pass secure information around. So if you introduce a common party, and you, many of you already have, but if you think of it as this central point of trust, and you say, I want to transfer money using my Swish app. I log in. The OWASP provider sends you to bank ID, does the dance, everything's great, adds the phone number in a jot and gives it back to the, to the app. Now, there's no chance that an eager hacker could change the API call and say, I want to check something on another user's phone number, even though I logged in. No, the phone number is asserted and in the token. You cannot change it. It's a claim. So we just send it to the API, and the API can verify it. And the thing is, we can add any type of attributes in here. There's no limit to what type of attribute sources you can or should add to your OWASP server. There are some guidelines, though. You should organize sensitive data so that it's only reachable by certain systems, like the OWASP provider or the OpenID provider. You should include identity-specific data in the token. You shouldn't include stuff like, it's raining outside. You should use opaque tokens on the internet and jots only internally. I'm going to leave it there. There's a lot of talks about that from us previously. We call it the phantom token flow. Google that if you don't know it. Um, and only add data when the client needs it. So you need, you need to be clever. Don't always add everything in every token going out. 
your OWA server needs to be clever and only adding data when it knows, okay, it's going to reach these APIs, then it needs these things, only that. So how do you identify this data that you put in there? Well, it should be relevant to most of your APIs, like the 80-20 rule. If 80% of your APIs need it, I mean, put it in there. It should not be application specific. No background color green of this app, that's not a good claim to put in there. It should be attributes about the user. And it should not be contextual, at least not in the OAuth tokens, because OAuth tokens can live for a very long time, can live for years. So if you say, this user was in Stockholm when he logged in, and you have that in the token, that's pretty useless six months later. So don't stick contextual data in, in the access tokens. The ID tokens in OpenID can have that sometimes. So to summarize what I've been saying, you should only trust a few sources. Define that point of trust. Use the standard protocols. Don't do spaghetti. Every time you add data to the things, to the request going away, identity data, even worse, if you sign it with a jot, you're adding a new portion of spaghetti into your soup. <laughs> Attributes are not claims. Attributes are just properties of something. They may or may not be true. Depends on who you trust. Because claims are easy. You just follow the, the anatomy. The car is yellow, says Jacob. Travis' phone number is 123123. 123, 123, says his wife. Jacob has a horse, says Travis. Thank you.